here it is. It's, uh, it's your chance to ask about self-driving cars before we drive them all off the road. Um, go. Uh, let me just put the screen on. Not a thing? Yes, Mr. Moon. So you talked about tool chain. Um, first thing, do you know the, uh, uh, there's a top case EU project that was doing something similar for avionics? I know all. I know lots about Topcase. Yes. Okay. So Topcase became um, what the Topcase uh, eventually is is basically is now called Eclipse Papyrus, um, and we have a, pol a group at Eclipse called Polarsys, which is building tool chains um, for very large, complex embedded systems. Um, uh, so yes, I know a fair bit about Topcase. Okay. Question is. So you because in in Topcase the the tool chain prototypes worked nicely, but as soon as it came to qualification of the tool chains, nobody had a clue how to do it. So the question is, um, you're, you're putting together functionality again. Do you have a strategy? How are you going to then qualify this as code emitting um, tools? That means they're going to be at the highest integrity level, which is T3. So the short answer is no, not yet. Uh, longer answer is a lot of the tools, or not a lot, many of the tools that are that are targeted in the various points along the way um, do have various levels of qualification. Okay. Um, so, but as an overall uh, system, like a system level qualification, uh, no, not yet. And that's an obvious weakness, right? I mean, if you're going to build uh, safety, um, safety, functional safety systems, uh, you need to be able to qualify the tools. Um, that's that's a prerequisite. But um, as a guy who's been trying to qualify Linux for over a decade, I think you have an understanding of how hard this is. <laughs> Others? Um, my question is regarding data access, and you brought it up post the accident that it's not available or it's proprietary as far as Uber is concerned. Uh, given that autonomous vehicles are slowly going to become ubiquitous as far as society is concerned. How do we access the data post an accident given the obvious liability implications for the company in question? Yeah, that's a great question. So I should, I should start by saying I'm not a lawyer. But, um, you know, I think in the case of an accident, that data needs to be made available to at least the people who are involved in that accident, and at least needs to be made available for people who work on explanatory artificial intelligence who can basically tell stories, like we've been working on, of what happened um, to compare that in the case of some sort of proceeding. Um, I'm not exactly sure about making that data completely public yet because I can understand with good reason why they're not making this accident data public, but not you know, especially in the case of the Uber accident, not disclosing anything about the different sensor hits if they were detected in enough time. I think not enough people are asking that question. Uh, everything she said, but I'll just add that, um, I mean, we already have some precedents, uh, both in the automotive industry and elsewhere, where accident data is made available in, at a certain rate and pace, depending on how the investigation goes. Um, so black, the black box from a, from a, the cockpit of an airplane, for example, that's a, you know, you know, eventually that if they can find it, eventually that data is going to be made public, and that's a known and accepted thing. Um, you know, automobiles today actually have sort of like a little black box that's recording basically the last what two minutes, five minutes. Depends on yeah, the, depends yeah. on the model, I guess. But yeah, and and oftentimes that ends up uh, as evidence in in accident trials. Um, so that seems to be generally accepted. I think what you're bumping into with the Uber thing right now is that um, the cars that are on the road right now are owned by Uber or Waymo or these companies. Um, so they're asserting, uh, you know, company confidential, company proprietary um, to, to, to basically lessen their potential liability in a court case. Um, so I think what's going to have to happen, this is eventually going to have to be something that gets fixed by law or regulation where um, there's going to have to be limits on hiding that information. I don't think companies like Uber or um, Google are ever going to give up that data just because. Um, so we're going to have to 
fight for it um, through through our legislators. It's not that it, it, it's not that difficult for the entities with subpoena power to get what companies have. The National Highway Traffic Safety Administration has power to pull data, which it mostly doesn't need because it gets cooperation, in part because it does so on a faultless basis that, that assumes that that data is not going to be used as evidence in liability proceedings. But, but you might want to broaden your account of this to ask how much data we do not have about all kinds of operation. Um, uh, Leilani used to work at CAIDA, which is the Internet Traffic Assessment uh, activity at the University of California, San Diego, run by my friend Casey Claffey. If you want to understand how we get internet traffic data uh, to try and understand how the internet works, I have the same bad news for you you have with respect to the automobiles. There are two sets of people who have the information necessary to understand how the internet really works from a traffic management point of view. One bunch of them are telecommunications companies who would never give that data to anybody because it would go to their competitors, and the other one is the NSA that won't give it to you because they'd have to kill you. <laughs> all, the, all, the all the data that we have about how the net works is scraps that fell off those two tables that the uh, telecommunications operators considered it in their temporary interest useful to give to researchers or that has come through unusual and unrepeatable pathways out of the intelligence services. Um, the same is going to be true for roadway data. You're thinking primarily about accident data, which is the easiest data to get because something has gone wrong and people with subpoena power want to know. What about all the ordinary data? The ordinary data, the data which you would think of as the baseline for all the judgments about what is reasonable or not reasonable and what really happens on roads is going to be subject to ownership rules and control rules that we haven't talked about today because we were only thinking about software governance in cars. But when we talk about all that connected transport and all the data being created by that connected transport and all the different public policy and economic market interests that are valuably now concerned with shaping that data and the rights about that data to their own needs, you can multiply by many orders of magnitude the statements that were motivating you to ask about accident data. This is part of why, at least from my point of view, the question of the freedom of the software is so important. If we are really going to wind up with a world in which the companies Mike works with have a beautiful open source tool chain for making a, a, a driving assistance and then autonomous driving software all for themselves, you can be sure that what they will do is to build proprietary software that controls the data. They will build the software as proprietary software precisely in order to control the data. Because the transport data, which contains location information about identifiable human beings and is therefore the most valuable data in the market right now, will also contain an awful lot of information about energy usage and patterns of movement and personal habits. Imagine just for a moment if you read the New York Times story yesterday uh, 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 in which the poor technology writer goes and asks Facebook for the information about himself and his headline is, yikes. <laughs> Imagine what happens when in addition to all the social graph data that Facebook has been keeping on him, including the contact information of all his exes, it also contains all the information coming out of his car. Everywhere he goes, everything he does, every little corner that he cuts, every too fast this, every was at a bar and then drove home that. Remember that all of that is going to fall into the possession of somebody. Well, Understand why it is that if the <coughs> user isn't allowed to modify the information in the, to modify the software in the car, that information will go where somebody else wants it to go. Now we're not just talking about accidents anymore. Now we're talking about ordinary life. There are already insurance companies today that want to put a dongle into your is it ODB slot yeah, for they, they already yeah, have th these things. This already <laughs> exists. So if you're willing to share 100 percent of your driving behavior with an insurance company, they will lower your rates. Um, I think most of the security breaches we've seen in cars exactly. Yep. Yeah. So the, exactly. and the thing about that is, so what they're doing is so. Um, Le Leanna was mentioning that the CAN bus is inherently insecure. It was never designed for security because exactly. security is always assumed to be air gapped. And now we're in the uh, the ODB thing or OBD thing is you know plugs directly into the CAN bus, 
and it's a Wi-Fi or LTE-enabled device, what could possibly go wrong? Mm -hmm. And by the way, I've seen, like, you can, if, if you know what you're doing on a CAN bus, um, you can accelerate, you can brake, you can turn the wheel. I mean, like, basically, you can control the car by sending instructions on the CAN bus. Um, again, I mean, what could go wrong? Nicholas. Just means it's time for creating a Raspberry Pi that you can plug the dongle into the Raspberry Pi and it can simulate anything so that you provide fake data so, to your insurance so that you can get a lower rate without giving away data. So I've been in, so I've so <laughs> I have been in a car in the parking lot at Bosch in Bangalore being driven by a Raspberry Pi. I've already had personally had that experience. So it's not that hard. A freedom bot. <laughs> if you wouldn't mind turning on that microphone so that the tape can hear you. Do you think as, as a rule in the future that LIDAR, both LIDAR and internal driver side cameras are going to be mandatory for auto driving in, in level five and such? Oh. Um, so that I'm not sure about. Um, and there are a couple reasons. I. I think what a lot of people don't realize, so LiDAR is this uh, laser-based technology that basically um, comes out of um, self-driving cars. I showed a picture of it in my slide, um, and it basically pings back to your car when you basically run into something. Um, it's extremely expensive. Um, so we're talking about 180 degrees and multiple hits for each angle. Um, it's very hard to process that type of data. So when you think about the amount of um, computing power that's just going into self-driving and then the sheer amount of computing that's going on just to process the LiDAR and then also to process the video, um, it's a lot. That's adding a lot of weight to the car. Um, so for that question, I'm not sure just based on pure computing power, but I think a lot of people are very interested in LiDAR, especially um, there's a group at MIT working on putting LiDAR technology on the chips themselves. So. Just for a moment that we say that the political economy of this is that the only reason to spend all that money on hardware is to eliminate a job. That the part of this that we need to think about is that from the economics of fleet activity, the only reason to spend all that money and take all that risk, technological risk, legal risk, all the rest of it, is in order to fire an awful lot of people which tells you that the gig economy isn't quite as cheap for the, the non-employer as you might have supposed. Because, of course, all the real money is in getting rid of those people. This means that that form of automotive transports economics, like the economics of the cloud itself, are really about firing a bunch of workers. The problem is once you fired that worker once, you can't fire her again. The savings are all up front, which is part of why we now see a price war in the public cloud, right? Everybody fired all their IT staff. They moved everything into the public clouds. But they can't recoup that savings every year. The people are gone. Now they begin to have to put pressure downwards on the price of a computing cycle. I think, as the, apparently the enrolled skeptic here about all this, I think the primary point here is that everybody now sees a killing in eliminating drivers. The trucking companies of the world see a killing in eliminating drivers. The gig transport companies see a killing in eliminating drivers. But it only works if it's a tightly oligopolized system, which is why the sharedmobilityprinciples.org view of the world is human beings should never be allowed to own their own self-driving cars. This is a way of changing the labor economics of transport. This isn't actually a really good way of changing transport. Everybody can see that there's going to be a long lag in this technology before it becomes even, never mind, safe, just theoretically possible. And once again, I want to point out that everybody is doing this in places where it never, ever snows. I like the idea that maybe a hurricane can move a mailbox across a street and that you can teach a computer that. But if you can teach a computer to drive in a New England blizzard and to find black ice and not be confused about where it is, then something really, really clever has occurred. All of this is, all of this is pure terrarium as far as I'm concerned. It's not the biosphere we actually live in. 
It's some little tank built to make it appear that this can work. And money is flooding towards that because people have jobs and we would like to take them away. And whether you're in favor of taking away people's jobs, like you know somebody I could name who used to be Speaker of the House of Representatives, or you're not, it's certainly the case that the economics of this only makes sense in a very short run. I, I, I know everybody in this room knows it, but you can't take a self-driving car to a car wash, right? Nobody actually thinks you can maintain these vehicles by just sort of squirting soap and water on them from time to time or buffing with a wax and a soft cloth. All of this stuff is incredibly fragile hardware, which says it works only under conditions of optimal maintenance in a world that automobiles don't do that in the 20th century. Automobiles drove around the world and went through Sahara and went through dry riverbeds in Pakistan and even my own car, if it could only have been cleaned with a toothbrush, man, I'd have had to abandon it day one, right? This, the, all of this is grossly unrealistic. It doesn't make any immediate technological sense. You have to assume that there are a large number of people whose livelihoods can be eliminated before this begins to make any economic sense and tens of billions of dollars are flowing towards it for very little reason. But we, we know for sure that the data that is generated is going to be valuable to platforms. We know that that is really there. That's the petroleum underneath all of this. And how we govern the software determines who owns the data. Which means that these issues we've been talking about of low-level software control are going to be where the real economic action in all of this is. Mark, you wanted to say something. So Leilani, the um, sort of reasoned view of decision making was mm -hmm. very interesting. Um, it's struck me that it's essentially a programming language. You have some constructs yeah. as mm -hmm. a sort of data or, 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 or primitives, and, and then the outcome is completely deterministic based on the code, effectively. Exactly, yeah. So like any software, it will have bugs. Exactly, Penguins yeah. in the refrigerator. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> there's very clear evidence, hard statistical evidence, that the inference-based approach just produces a better result than humans. Humans are essentially doing a kind of computing that's very similar, and they're doing it in a pretty average kind of way, um, and they're easily distracted. So we will, with, with, you know, in my mind, there is no doubt that inference-based driving will be much safer for everybody than humans doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. So therefore, it's gonna happen. Okay. Imagine, though, that people then also want to have your explanatory approach in there how would those two systems work together? You've got a bunch of sort of silicon wetware effectively that can't explain itself, mm -hmm. but that is probably gonna give you statistically a much better result than anything that's codified. Mm -hmm. And you've got a codified system that might be able to rationalize or explain a behavior. How would you see those two working together? That's a great question. That's a question I'm trying to answer. So, um, you know, in, in my group, in my research group, we're, we're a little bit turned off to the probabilistic type approaches. Um, but I think that they're necessarily necessary, and I definitely think that they have to go hand in hand. So, I mean, the way I would love to see it is just, you know, two systems working at the same time. One sort of doing the decision making that it can do with its best sort of results, and then an explanatory system evaluating that that made sense with the current, um, the current data and the current system state that you have. Um, I don't know how tangible that is right now because it's fairly slow, but... I was struck with your mailbox crossing the road example. It's literally like a person saying, I don't believe my eyes. Right? Well, exactly, yeah. <laughs> Which is not a good sign. Yeah, <laughs> but if you could take, I mean, one of, so our explanatory system is sort of two part. One is like to show the, the operator or the, whoever is in the car um, sort of what's, go what's going on and what's reasonable or not. But the second case is for actually the, um, the system that you were describing is, can we take the evidence that we've created in this explanatory model and then feed that back into the system and say, you know, don't use this information as much or do use this information or we think this doesn't make sense. I read an article just recently about chess. 
And one of the things is, so, so it's been, a, for years now, you can get a computer, it doesn't even, by today's standards, not even a supercomputer, and they can, it can beat a chess master. But they did some interesting experiments where um, you take a, like the best supercomputer, and you team that up against a chess master, who has just like a, like a hand, like a, the cheapest possible AI for chess. Like a handheld, the kind of chess simulator that you ha can get on your smartphone. And a supercomputer cannot beat that combination. Um, so maybe, maybe to Evan's point, we should stop thinking so much about fully autonomous systems and start thinking about assisted systems. Because there's, there is some evidence, and chess is a very constrained environment, but there is some evidence that perhaps the combination of artificial intelligence and a human intelligence, that combination is actually much stronger than either by themselves. So what you're saying is for deterministic systems or fully understood systems, they could be effective, but for highly non-deterministic systems, I really question that this will happen. Um. Right, or it might happen for a different reason. I agree with you that the, that the, 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 the grandmaster assisted by the palm top chess player example may not be very useful for this, but, but, but one of the things that happens when human beings drive automobiles is they, ha they make reflex decisions which are wrong. Uh, and they make them because they're emotionally affected by the environment. Uh, you can teach somebody to turn into a skid, but you may not be able to teach them to, the, right the first time, and it's the first time that matters. There's a reason that the airplane says to the pilot, pull up, pull up, and it isn't because the pilot doesn't know. It's because under certain kinds of circumstances, even a pilot who does know something as obvious as pull up, pull up, might actually have her behavior modified by being told that at the right moment by navigational aid. So I do think that, that, the, uh, that the argument that Mike is offering might be correct. If Leilani had a really good explainer that was, that was working uh, 15 seconds or even two seconds ahead of the driver, some kinds of interventions by assist might really make a difference to human behavior, even if you're ultimately counting on the human being to do the right job. Not to mention extra sensory capabilities, right? If, so LiDAR is very expensive now. If you were producing a billion LiDARs a year, it would probably be a lot cheaper. I mean, just to you know, throw one example, but even with cameras and so on, it is possible to easily imagine an assistant that could sense things that a human being might miss or would be distracted by, not even, and certainly, uh, you know, driving, um, driving late at night in the rain, um, you can, there are definitely sensors that could be, that could easily augment uh, our own eyesight. But don't we have that problem in medical systems now that we have assist systems that are resulting in doctors not being able to diagnose very basic things? So it's not a, a, a feedbackless system. The long-term consequence, we're not looking at that. For short term, that's the same thing that we had with ABS systems. When ABS was introduced, it massively reduced the accident rate until everybody adjusted his driving style to ABS. That's actually not true. When ABS was first introduced, the accident rates went up because people freaked out the first time their brake pedals started fluctuating. Um, so there was actually, when, they, when ABS first went out, this is back to the, the first use thing where it's steering, in, steering into a skid, right? There was lots of evidence when uh, people would, you know, when, when the first time my mom's ABS went off, she had no idea what was going on and she went eek and lifted, up her, lifted her foot off the brake, which is not exactly the right solution. So, I mean, um, okay. but I think, but what you're just pointing out is, is a truism. It's like humans and computers are augmenting ourselves throughout everything we do. They don't, at least in Canada, they no longer teach handwriting, right? They no longer teach the multiplication tables. Right? Why would a human need to know that stuff? Um, so um, th this, this is a fact of life in pretty much all aspects of, of our future cyborg experience. Or now we are back again to one of the reasons we care so much about users' ability to modify and improve the technology they use, because there is a feedback in the system, unquestionably. 
in fact, non-deterministic and hard to calculate. But one of the things we can do is to assist human beings to adapt to technology by making it possible for them to adapt the technology to themselves. Everywhere that we make it possible for people to modify technology, the result ought to be, over time, a convergence on forms of human-machine behavior which are more advantageous to human beings. This is what I have always thought the free software revolution was about, was allowing people and computers to adapt to one another in better and less power redistributive ways by allowing uh, technology, by forcing technology to allow users the, the effect of their rights. This does seem to me to be a part of the conversation we're having today, my part I care a lot about, with respect to why it is that we would want people to be able to modify the software in cars. It, whatever are those adaptation cycles that we're all now talking about, how we adjust, how the technology adjusts, how we adjust, how the technology adjusts, it is the recognition that users have rights and that they should be able to understand and affect what's going on, which enables that cycle to achieve the kind of productivity we've seen in the digital world. I do not think that we are in any way likely to make this trip you all say we're going to make to fully autonomous driving at all quickly unless user innovation is a large part of how we get there. And that ought to involve, one would think, evolutionary activity from less assistance to more assistance, back to less, forward to more, uh, as we reshape driving. I, I don't particularly want to lose handwriting, and I don't particularly want to lose mental arithmetic, I also don't want to lose the skills that human beings have built up over the past hundred years in driving cars. It may very well be that inferences are going to do better than people, Mark. I, I don't know whether that's true. But if it's true, the machines had to learn from somebody, and who was there to learn from except us? Well, we will know if they're better than us when they start lying to us for their own profit. <laughs> <laughs> yes. This is why this is why as Mark Zuckerberg got ready to go and testify everybody started watching 2001 again. I think this is exactly I think this is exactly right. I think Stanley Kubrick saw it and I think people are being reminded of it right this minute. That is exactly what they're afraid of. That's why HAL 9000 <laughs> continues to be such an important part of the history of computing even though it never existed because people really do believe that. I think that's exactly right, Nicholas. I think that's it in a nutshell. Yes, sir. Um, on that note, I was wondering, um, when a human being is in a car accident, they're presented with a lot of raw sensory data, and they often confabulate, sometimes unintentionally, an explanation for what happened that puts them not at fault. I was wondering, what is the best safeguard to ensure that a machine does not also confabulate an explanation why it is not at fault? when some of the actors in the supply chain may want it to do that. Yeah, um, man, I wish my advisor was here. This is his bread and butter. Um, so what he would say is basically you have to have this constant and consistent monitoring system. So you wrap all of the parts in this sort of monitor that's constantly explaining what it's doing and you keep building those sorts of layers so that everyone is checking on each other at a certain, at each layer and each part of that system. So if you have those sorts of inconsistencies, maybe, you know, maybe you say, oh, there are two scenarios, right? Let's say that, um, either the brakes lied or they were truthful, and you present two different stories and see what's believed in that scenario. All we have to remember is how the computer in the movie 2001 lied through his digital nose. So. Well, that's one way of thinking about what happened. And another way of thinking about it was that it had no nose, but it had a profit motive or a, a, a self-interest. I mean, autonomous agents are either going to explain how they work in the 21st century or they will run things. Right? I do believe that we are moving rapidly into a world in which there will be two kinds of autonomous agents in the 21st century. One of them will be built as Chinese technology under the control of the Chinese Communist Party and one of them won't. I have a deep political concern for the autonomous agents of type one. And I have a little bit of optimism about the possibility of autonomous agents of type two. Skeptical as I am, I have no desire to abandon the field. 
because I recognize that human power has an awful lot to gain from the creation of unaccountable autonomy located in centralized platform systems that are subject to government power. That's a recipe for an eternal form of despotism I do not want the human race to live in. The mythology about that is entirely credible. It's not that it's off-the-shelf technology right now, but there is no doubt that we can be two decades from that. We can be two decades from a world where, in which powerful autonomous agents <laughs> occupying themselves with vast data collected out of civil society are running civil society. Chinese Communist Party has already attached the citizen rating system to the purchase of mobility. Train tickets and airplane tickets in China are now being sold on the basis of checking against your citizen rating. That is essentially a system of restricting mobility for unpopular persons and further control over those forms of human activity which are dependent upon mobility, which pretty much all human activities are of any value, will come increasingly to fall under algorithmic control. That part I don't feel skeptical about. The question how good we can make the products for the people is a hard question. But 21st century political economy says that well, in the 20th century were products, in the 21st century are services. And as we watch products becoming services, and mobility is doing that, that's the, that's the subject of our, of our meeting, as that becomes a service, the people become it. Everybody is feeling that now about social media and these cheap services we all know how to federate that are being offered in centralized form in return for total surveillance all the time. Now people are beginning to wake up to, oh, so when Facebook is the service, the people are the product. And we are talking about the ways in which mobility, which is crucial to the 21st century economy as it was in the 20th, is going to become a service. And we are therefore implicitly discussing to what extent the people are going to be the product. We are worried about their safety physically. We are worried about their insurance rates and the nature of whether they're going to own a car or rent a mobility service. And behind that I want to say we are worried about what the effect is upon the autonomy of people at the deepest level as it becomes the case that we are the product of the mobility services we use. The product is knowledge about us, everywhere we go, how we get there, what we're doing while we're moving, what we do when we arrive, all of which at the end of the day is control somebody exercises over people. If we, if we think about this in relation to the day we've just spent, and we cast our mind back to what it would have sounded like if we had been talking about so software for social networking 10, 12 years ago, a thing I used to do back then when it was still there and there was still some point in it, we would recognize the ways in which the, 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 the concepts we are manipulating today are going to have an effect on the privacy and therefore the autonomy of human beings 10, 15, 20, I don't care how many years from now, which will further affect what it means to be a human being in the 21st century. For this reason, at least for me, for this reason, it is absolutely crucial that we figure out what people's rights in this technology are going to be and how to secure their ability to exercise them. So if, the, if it's inevitable that um, the useless class is going to kind of predominate the 21st century given the amount of automation and discrimination becomes personalized based on the data that you and I as individuals are generating ourselves. How can we stop people becoming products or is it inevitable given the interconnection of systems? And That's another conference on how to use Raspberry Pi and Freedom Box to liberate the human race. Come back in the fall, I'll be about ready for that then. I'll send you an invitation. More about cars? Um, Leilani, I, I, I'm curious about when, when um, watching your presentation, some of the ideas, it, it sounded interesting that a lot of the logic you described sounds like exactly the logic that the car itself has to use to drive in the first place, right? 
many of the cars, as I understand it, the, the Teslas and many of the cars that are being developed with that kind of goal, actually they're, they're surprisingly based on heuristics instead of just, you know, network, uh, neural networks and so on. So, which means it sounds like actually the, the kind of logic that the car itself uses to drive is precisely using that kind of semantics, right? It's like I, I can see there's probably visual systems and so on and say I can see a mailbox and then they inform and decide and there's probably a log. So I, I would expect actually that the Teslas, for example, they ha have something like what you described. They have not just, not just logs, but they have a decision-making procedure. Um, how do you see that? Is, isn't it the fact that it already exists? Is, it's already something that can explain that kind of logic? Sorry, can you repeat the last part of your question? Um, yeah, so, so the question is really, how do you see that? It sounds like from, from, it may sound like looking at what happens, at least in that area, you can see how, how your work is, is really useful in many of those systems, but at least in that area, it sounds like the car has already, already has to make a decision, the car has to explain to itself that this is sensible given those sensors, this is why I'm drifting, yeah. right? Um, is it the case? So I guess the, the short answer to that is I don't know. So I, I don't know what any of the car manufacturers do as of now in any type of error detection. If I ask them and I say we have our system, we'd love it to compare it to yours, they come back and they say, oh, you know, that's, that's proprietary, we can't tell you what we do. Um, I can tell you what I think that means, but um, I'll spare it. So I, I would hope that that's the case. But I think something novel that we have that they don't do is, is we keep track of all the dependencies of that decision. So a lot of um, car companies, I believe, don't keep track of all those dependencies. Maybe they keep track of the one they, they thought was the most important in that decision, but we really, we really keep track of that from step one. Um, and then we use our sort of reasoning system to figure out who was at fault. So I think that's, it, it might be the same process. They might be doing a similar thing, but I think that we try and keep track of the right sorts of things to make the explanations that need to happen. You know, Gustavo, this is gonna be a place where performance is going to affect design fundamentally. Nobody has enough computing power to do everything in real time. They have to throw a bunch of stuff away. We are both aware of the ways in which the technology design in our corner of the world has been affected by chasing performance at all costs. Yeah, uh, th we're going to have meltdown and specter in, in many different senses, as Nicholas was pointing out with respect to the non-deterministic non behavior of multi-core machinery once you start doing branch prediction and but they, w w what we can be pretty sure of is that whatever Mr. Musk's programmers are doing, they're throwing away most of the information she is keeping because it would take too long with any economically feasible set of machinery inside the car to consider everything all the time. So there's probably an awful lot of triage in that design, right? There's an awful lot of flying by the seat of pants because that's the only way you can do it quick enough to do it in real time, don't you think? I'm not so sure. I think, I think the, the um, I actually can imagine that they, they actually do something very similar to what Leyland presented as an explanation to, to actually make the decisions. For example, even, even if we think about the case that is just being you know, so, so debated in the last few days about the, the, the accident, um, look at other videos and other, other people that started posting the same kind of behavior. It, it's, it looks very clearly like the car is just centering it between the lines, right? The car is centering between the lines and then there's something in the middle that it cannot detect. The, the centering between the lines is, is very heuristic, you know? It's like there are two lines and then you, you, you make the machine actually center between the lines, which means this is easy to log, it's easy to explain, it's just that I, I think Yes, I agree that it's going to take a while, but it doesn't sound like the, the problem of, for example, real time is, is so difficult in that kind of scenario. Ah, that depends upon how easy it is to see the lines. Yeah. Yeah. 
I, I like driving in California because it never snows there and the roads don't break up in the winter time and the lines between lanes have nice little raised reflectors on them so it's much easier to drive. There, Over Russian... here or in Brazil we don't have yeah. quite such nicely marked lines, yeah. right? And so the algorithm for centering between the lines is a lot more complicated and it has to deal with cognitive gaps when you don't know what the lines are and you decide what to do about that which human beings have some heuristics for if we have been driving for several hundreds of thousands or millions right. of miles. But by the end of the day, you still have sensors that detect lines or detect people or detect mailboxes, and, and those are inputs to a system that is probably not just a neural network. It's heuristics-based. Maybe, and it may have room for an ontology as deep as hers, but it probably doesn't have time to consult it. So it's not busy trying to distinguish between mailboxes and inflatable toys that look like mailboxes or skateboards with people chasing them or just a, a, a wheel uh, from a skateboard that fell into the street and is lying by the side of the road. I don't know how that stuff is being done. I'm sure they're keeping it very secret. I really want to read the code, like you want to read the code. Yes. Like you're suggesting that if, she would show, if they would show her the code, she could finish her PhD faster and better. <laughs> We're all in the same condition. Could we please see the code? To which the answer might be, yeah, we would show that to you in some sense, but don't ever think of experimenting with it, in which case we haven't really seen it. Because we really don't know how to deal with computer programs just by reading them. We all need to fool around with them. We always have. I, I, I do think you may be right that what may be going in there is really, really good. And it may be that if you and I spent an evening reading it, we would think, oh, man, this code is terrible. <laughs> do they, do, do they understand how dangerous this is? I'm not saying either way, to, just to be clear. I'm not saying it either way, right? My, my take, I'll bet, I would bet big bucks on two things. One is whatever that software is, it's not rules-based. I can almost freaking guarantee that's not how it works. And the second thing is I'm pretty sure if you read the code, it wouldn't be that interesting because most of the stuff that actually matters is the, is the weightings in the, in the data that they've, that they've used to teach it. And uh, so you could have the code would be very, very generic and boring. It's all in the data. And I can guarantee you they're not giving you the data. Right, or, or at any rate, that that's what our next conference really ought to be about, yeah. right? Because <clears throat> that is where the action is going to be. But in order to do that, we first have to establish some other things. We have to figure out how we can prove to people that we can operate in ways that consult everybody's interests and also have some room for our rights to inquire into and fool around with this technology. Nicholas said a thing when we were at lunch together which bears repeating here. His, his argument was there should be no two identical cars on the road ever. That monoculture is a deep threat to safety and to good technological development here. And uh, at 10 to the eighth units deployed, it's gonna be hard to make them all different. But assuming that there are, let us say, 10 to the fourth hackers who really wanna do this, and 10 to the eighth cars out there for them to do it to, it would be really a good idea to allow an awful lot of diversity before we create technical monocultures of any kind let alone lock them down or keep them secret or in other ways make it harder for us as a species to improve this stuff upon which our future does indeed depend. More? Daniel. Uh, to the point about the curious separation of the explanation system and the thing that's doing the things that need to be explained, I remember reading some neuroscientists say that uh, in humans, uh, when a human is challenged to explain something they've done, the mechanism in their brain that they're using to generate that explanation is not the same one as the one that caused them to perform that action. There have been some split brain uh, experiments that showed this by showing a situation in which a human's explanation was complete, could not have been the reason that they performed that action. So I suppose to pose that as a question, um, is it possible that if we produce these ex explanation systems that they might in fact take a form like that? And if so, is it actually still gonna be dependable as a way of having a neural network or whatever explain itself, if there is that separation? Thank you for 
left brain, right brain, There's like two computers in the one computer to drive the car and the other computer to do nothing but explain why it did what it did later. Uh, actually, you know what? I've heard I've heard worse ideas. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I, I I say that because you know there's precedent in the biological world that counterintuitive as it might seem, that might end up being the solution. And if that turns out to be the solution, might we actually discover it's of no use? I'm pretty sure what you'd find out is the, the part of your brain that makes up the story that tell or explains it is the same part of your brain that knows how to lie. I'm just guessing, but I'm pretty sure it's the same spot. I think that's right. Well, it's a, it's a thing we did before. We've done it in the, throughout the history of computing. We, we, we've built machines basing them on the way we thought we thought attempting yeah. to copy the nature of human intelligence, and we were wrong every single time. Yeah. We built very interesting stuff, but never did we actually build what we thought we were building, which is us. And, and, and that's either a really good outcome or a really frustrating outcome. I suppose, again, part of that disposition here is that I always thought that was really advantageous, as long as we could read the code and understand why what we had built wasn't who we are. You want to talk about floating point problems and the APL interpreter on which I spent many years of my life trying to get it all to work right. Uh, it was very important that machines don't do arithmetic the way people do arithmetic. Exactly. That was really very helpful. It reminded you at all times that you couldn't possibly trust anything you thought you knew about how you do arithmetic because 10 times point 0.1 isn't exactly one in there. And it makes a very big difference to know that the machines we built don't understand math the way we understand it. They understand it differently. Fuzzy comparison could not exist without that insight, I believe. All right, I think uh, as it is past 5 o'clock that we should say thank you to our guests for their extraordinary effort. <laughs>